We're about to watch a commutation hearing. That means that he has a life sentence and he's right now seeing that if he can get that commuted so that he'll be eligible for parole. I also have the court details of what actually happened. So we'll review that after the case. With that, let's jump in. All right, the uh, party board is back in session. It's 1025 a.m. Uh, and we are ready for our next case. Uh, sir, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number. Carrie Lassane, 99233. Okay, uh, good morning, Mr. Lassane. Uh, let me explain, the pro let me ask your counsel to introduce themselves. Good morning, Jasmine Cole with the Parole Project, speaking on behalf of Mr. Carrie Lassane. And I, with the board's permission, I'd like to make a brief statement at the end. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lassane, I know that uh, Ms. Cole has explained the process to you, so for the benefit of everyone who's joined us today, let me just go over it real quickly. Uh, I will read some identifying information in your record. I ask you to verify that information. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Keith Freeman, seated to my far right. This is the case that's been assigned to him. He'll take the lead on the interview process. Uh, we'll hear from the folks there at Angola. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll hear from the folks that indicate if they'd like to speak. So here uh, in the room with us this morning, uh, we have representatives of the victim. We have uh, Dominique Morgan, Teddy Willis, and Terry Landry Potman, all of whom, uh, well, Ms. Uh, Teddy Willis will be speaking. Um, <clears throat> and joining us also by um, Zoom, we have uh, the Parole Project, Mr. Terry Myers, Arlene Lassane, Paula Fosho, Monique Olivier, and Eugene Fosho. Um, Mr. Myers, Ms. Arlene, and Ms. Paula will be speaking on their behalf. Uh, at the end, we'll ask you if there's a statement you'd like to make uh, <clears throat> before we turn it over to Ms. Paula. Okay. Now, did I have everybody? I don't know that I have all the folks who are who are there at Angola. Yes, yes ma'am. Everybody. Did I call out their name? I'm not so sure if I did. No, ma'am, you did. Can y'all see so your name? So, folks there who are there in support of uh, Mr. Lassane to introduce themselves. Carol Lassane, Carol's mother. Mm -hmm. Tiana Lassane, Carol's brother. Okay. Well, good. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. So, Mr. Lassane. You are Terry C. Lassane Sr. Your DOC number is 99233. You're here seeking commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in the 16th JDC St. Martin uh, in April 1982 for a first degree murder. You received a life sentence. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Freeman. Yes, Mr. Um, how old are you currently? 62. Okay. And uh, how long have you been in? 40 years. Okay. Um, your statement was, was pretty confusing. Um, it went back and forth. So today, tell us exactly what happened and, and why it happened. You're talking about the crime itself? Yes, sir. Um, I was in Lafayette with some friends that night and we were just having fun drinking and stuff and I decided to go home. I got on the interstate and got off of the Henderson exit. I turned in at the Hungry Hobo gas station and restaurant. Um, I pulled up, there was a little gas station attendant there and he asked me what I would need. I told him I needed a few, some gas, and he put the spot in the engine in the car and he walked away. Uh, when the pump finished pumping, he was walking around the station. I took the pump out, put it back in. And when he walked up to me, I leaned in the car, pulled out a gun. I held the gun to him, told him to give me the money in the register. And he gave me the money in the register and, uh, 
And uh, we walked to the back of the building. I told him to walk to the back of the building. We walked to the back of the building. I pulled the gun out and I shot him. And I shot him the second time as he fell. Were you on drugs tonight? This was uh, this happened. No, no, sir, I was not. Do you do drugs? Have you done drugs when you were on the outside? No, sir. I no, sir. I, I never did. No. I mean, I smoked a little weed, but I never, I never did drugs. No. Did you drink a lot? Over the, on the weekend, some yes, sir. Um, you also had a, a crime in Texas. Tell me what happened in Texas. Oh, I was charged with uh, burglary. Uh, uh, I sold a TV dinner and a can of Vienna sausage. That was it. Okay, that, that's taken care of now, or do they still have a detainer on them? I was never contacted, sir. Never. Um, what is going to be your transition plan if you get out? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to stay? What are you going to do? Uh, my intention is to go to Pro Project in Baton Rouge with Mr. Kerry Myers. And um, they have a program there, I was told, and I'm going to go through the program process and get me a job and go to work. I've seen you taking a, a pretty good bit of classes since you've been in, incarcerated. Tell me about a couple of classes that you got the most out of. I know you're seeing the AAA. Um, I didn't join the AA because I believed that I was an alcoholic. Uh, it was pretty much that when I first came here, I didn't know anyone. And uh, there was an old guy in the dorm that offered me to go to AA classes. And when I went to him, uh, I seen that I could really enjoy myself there and learn a lot. I was, my intention was to better educate myself in any way I, I could. But A provided me with a lot of resources because I could help them as much as they helped me. I was an artist, and I, well, I learned to be an artist, and uh, I did a lot of programs and stuff. We had the first Information Day seminar in the prison, and uh, it provided me with a lot of education. That was my main focus because I couldn't get into the programs here because I was a lifer and uh, you couldn't get in any of the programs here as be able to gain certificates for anything like that to help you. So I had to go through just the classes that I could take anywhere I could. Yeah, I see you took uh, victim awareness. What did you learn from victim awareness? <laughs> I'm sorry. That was the hardest program I had ever taken. I really did. Um, I didn't know how many victims there were that I actually hurt. And uh, see. I just say I learned a lot from it. I learned to be able to look at people different and myself different too. I'm a better judge of character and uh, I learned to be able to think before making making a decision. Um, I see you uh, had 73 write-ups that you've been in prison. You've had none since 2015. What changed in 2015? You've written up quite often, and all of a sudden, for seven years, you haven't gotten any land. I 
I know I have to tell you the truth, so I'm going to do that. Um, my wife and my mother come visit me together. And after visiting that day, they were leaving. And my wife turned around and came back to me and wished me Merry Christmas. And it was then that I realized that I wasn't going to spend another Christmas with them. And uh, I kind of started straightening up a little bit, I guess you could say. I was just starting to pay attention to things that I was doing and saying. And I might ask you this again, just because, I mean, you, you've taken, uh, you completed 12 steps, you've been to AA, you should celebrate the summer. But you still say you don't have a drug or an alcohol problem. That's, you just took those classes? According to what I learned in AA, um, you'll always have a problem. You, there's always that opportunity for you to pick some pick pick up a drink or a, a drug or, or something and I, I don't I don't I believe that I'm an alcoholic because I drank because it was a program for me to be able to do it and that's 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 what I call it a program because of the way that I did because of the way I drank it was a regular thing for me to do it on a weekend even though I may not have been intoxicated every weekend or every other weekend, but I did drink and therefore I consider myself an alcoholic. Sorry, go ahead. Will you continue AA and NA for you relief? If possible, yes, sir. I would like to because there's a lot to learn in it, not just getting up in front of people drinking coffee and say, hello, my name is Bucky and I'm an alcoholic. More to that. Okay. Uh, must note that uh, all law enforcement is opposed. Uh, your family, your mother, your brother, uh, son, sister, they're unopposed. Vicky's family is strongly opposed. Um, the mother, sister, uh, numerous family members are opposed. Um, Warren, do you have anything uh, to say uh, about the thing? The, the only thing, Mr. Freeman, that I would have to add is in looking at uh, at Terry's location sheet and looking at his, his jobs that he's moved around since 2015 when you speak about uh, him straightening up is that there's been a lot of institutional need in the transfers, meaning that Carrie has, in a sense, kind of been thrown around, per se, from job to job for institutional need. He's not complained about any of these things that he's been moved. He may have been happy in one job. If we needed to move to another, we're moving. I've not had any trouble with him moving, moving around like that. Um, and I think that just further speaks to what you were talking about. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mrs. Jackson has some questions. Good morning, Ms. Hussain. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, my name is Bonnie Jackson, and I just want to uh, talk to you about a couple of things. Uh, you told us the what of this case, but you haven't told us the why. One, why did you decide to rob? You said you admitted you know, killing him during a robbery, but why were you even committing a robbery to begin with? Can't hear me. Why did you do it? Why? What did you do it? Why? Why? Oh, you know, ma'am, I thought that for years, and as far as for why, I don't. I I really don't know. I don't. I mean, I made a bad thought. I really did. But and I, you said that you didn't have a drug alcohol or alcohol problem. You had been out and for whatever reason you chose to go to that store. So how does that 
become a robbery that leads to a murder? Why didn't you just go home? What was going on with you that caused you to uh, rob this young man? I don't know, but I can say this at the time I was going through a lot of different things, but it was family marital problems that I was going to. Um, I, I, I guess I have to say I just, I needed the money and that's why I robbed him. So why did you take his life? He asked you, are you going to kill me? You assured him that you were not going to kill him. And then you killed him. Why did you kill him? I guess out of fear, afraid that I'd get caught. And you didn't think about the possibility that you would get caught before you committed the crime? No, ma'am, I did not. I'm being honest, I did not. Another thing, uh, Mr. Buchanan, and I understand that people are different in their ability to express themselves or, or, or different, not everyone able to articulate things as well as others. But one of the things that struck me in your application is when you applied for this hearing, there was nothing in your application that indicated any kind of remorse on your part. You know, typically we get, you know, even if it's just nominal, we get people to say that they're sorry and you know, how they wish they could take it back. Uh, but your application says I should get out because I've done all these programs. And then when you were granted a hearing and uh, you were interviewed for uh, the pre uh, clemency investigation, again, uh, you had the opportunity to express some level of remorse or some level of understanding of of the magnitude of the harm that you caused, but again, I just did not see that anywhere in your application. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, ma'am, I can. I'm not the most intelligent person in the world, but I do know that I can't put what I feel on paper. And the only thing that I could say to that is that I would have to be standing before you like I am today and tell you that I am sorry, but I was always told don't say you're sorry. And and what I mean by that is express what you say. And the only way I can express what I feel is that to say now that I'm sorry for what I've done and possibly um, do something that would express the way I feel, make make me better, make things better with myself. Because taking all those programs, I wasn't told that I had to take those programs. I took those programs to better educate myself. I didn't take those programs to, because I felt like, okay, in 40 years from now, I'm gonna go before a, bo a board that's gonna wanna hear that I took these programs. I tried to educate myself, not to back up and make it worse than what I was. Am I sorry for what I did? How about, let's say it this way, I'm ashamed of what I did. But yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. I know I can't take it back, and I guess you've heard that over and over before. But the only way thing that I can do is better what I've done and try to make myself better and try to let people show in my actions that I am sorry, but I'm trying to be better. Because I can be better. I know I can. I've proven that to myself. So Thank I'm you. sorry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Um, at this time, we'll hear from those who are uh, in support of the parole project. Mr. Myers. Good morning, Terry Myers. What are you doing? Parole project. At 
after serving uh, 41 years of incarceration, uh, Mr. Lewis Sang's 62 years old, as he's told you, uh, he's in good health. He is still capable of employment. Uh, this, he still has uh, time. He's still a young man, in, in, at least by my standards, he is. Uh, he is very capable of, of, of employment. He has heavy equipment and other skills he learned during those uh, 41 years of incarceration, and he has multiple job offers. Parole Project stands by Mr. Lesang to offer him the transition that he needs. 41 years is obviously uh, more than a day or two. The world has changed significantly since he has been incarcerate, incarcerated, and he is exactly the type of client uh, that Parole Project is here to help uh, through that transition. The services that he needs are the, exactly the services that we provide. Uh, the time to transition, the ability to decompress, the, the skills that he will learn for, through Parole Project. Uh, you heard the comments, you heard how he has been uh, willing to take on any, any assignment he's given uh, without, without question. Uh, he has extraordinarily uh, strong family support once he has completed Parole Project. Uh, 41 years alone, is not a reason to grant Mr. Lewis Sang a uh, recommendation today. 41 years with the work that Mr. Lewis Sang has done on himself is an excellent reason to grant him a recommendation today. So I would ask this board uh, to consider that in totality and grant him a recommendation today. Mr. Meyer, um, Ms. Arlene Lewis Sang. Yes, ma'am. And okay, we'd like to hear from you now. Okay, I am Bucky's wife, ex-wife, and best friend. We were married in 1979, and we have a son, Carrie Jr., and a grandson, Logan. Logan, and I believe Carrie deserves a second chance. I have always been by his side to visit, uh, phone calls, letter writing, and emails and I am proud of his accomplishments. He receives a, GN, a GN, GED and numerous certificates. He participated in rodeos, rode, um, he rode the wagon led by Pejeron horses in many rodeos and out of, out of the prison as a trustee faculty. A trust, I'm sorry, I'm a class A trustee. Class A trustee. He learned many trades and good work ethic. Oh, I can't even talk anymore. I'm sorry. Um, ethic from taking care of horses to now road and letters. He has hobbies from painting beautiful paintings and turning beautiful bowls. As a family, we'll all support each other by having many conversations and making many decisions as a family. I love him and really would like to see him at, get a second chance and see him home. Thanks for listening to me. And thank you for participating. Ms. Kosho. Ma'am? Um, we'd like to hear from Paula. Oh. I don't know, Paul. Hello? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. We'd like to hear from you. I didn't know I was supposed to talk today. All right. But well, if you'd like to, you don't have to. It's not required. But if you'd like to say a few words, we'd be happy to hear you. As a family, we miss not having him around. As a mother and a grandmother, I miss not being able to share with my brother everything we do on a daily basis. I have not been able to visit with him as much because I have a sickness 
but I love my brother with all my heart. And I think he has, I'm going to tell you my, I think he served his time. I think it's time for him to get a second chance. Yes, ma'am. Thank That's you. All. Thank you for your uh, for your words. We appreciate it. Uh, at this time, we'll hear from uh, Ms. Teddy Willard. So initially, I wasn't prepared to speak today. We had um, ten gang members that created a few, um, but it's kind of it's important on behalf of our family. So I was nine when my brother died, and my sister is seven years older, and she was a senior in high school. Um, on the day my brother died, I was in my house when a family friend that owned the home of Hobo knocked on the door and was facing. We were sleeping in the living room as a peak, and the sound of your mother screaming in the next room was nothing that a nine-year-old could get. Um, she was out of town and had to come home and didn't know why she was coming home. Um, we lost our brother that day, but probably the, the lasting effect was we lost our mother. Because our mother, that was a kind, caring, um, energetic, involved woman, became someone that was none of those things. But she was she was broken and she remained broken until the day she died. And we lost our mother. And as a nine-year-old, to lose your brother that you've only known for nine years is something you can. It's something you can never know. But I had a mother for the next 50 or 40 years that was never, ever going to be the same. Um, she since passed away. And in some ways, I'm very thankful that she's not here today because it would break her another day. She is, was the driving force behind this. There's a lot of things that were said um, that have me questioning, should he get out? In addition to the, the, the failure of remorse, I'm married to someone that is in AA. And for him to say that I would go to AA is possible. It is always possible to go to AA. It is not something that's ever left behind. You can go in any big town, any small town, a town of less than 100, and you can find a meeting of AA. So that concerns me that it's not an I will, it's an if possible. The other piece to that is he said he's still not sure why he did it. So if you're not sure why you did it 41 years ago, 42 years ago, then what makes me comfortable saying, should he have marital problems again? Should he need money again? Should he be fearful of the repercussions and not going to do this again to someone else? That concerns me because he said it's not as a result of drugs or alcohol or impairment of a substance. That's concerning, even after 42 years. He says he's a better judge of character. It's really difficult to say that when your character is around you, also in prison along with you. I agree with the family that they, I, I understand why they want him to have a second chance. They've lost him, but they can go visit him and he gets a second chance. That's not something you can get. My niece doesn't have that opportunity. My mother never had that opportunity. We as a family never had the opportunity to ever get a goodbye by second chance. He's 18. My my children now are older than that. And they don't know their uncle. They never have. My, so I have a difficult time accepting a lot of the conversation in, in where we are. Um, and a lot of what Terry has said, he says it was, it's made me better. He could better educate himself. It was all about what he's done for him. But it doesn't tell me what he's done 
to secure the fact that this may not happen again in another instance. Thank you for hearing us out. Thank you, Jada. Thank you for being here. We do have some comments from Dominique Morgan. She says, my life has been directly affected even all these years later. I never know who my uncle was because he seems to care about no one. My life will forever be affected by his disgusting actions. Um, also from Terry Landry Fontenot, my life was forever changed on April 15, 1981. He took my brother's life and my mother was never the same. Not a day goes by without pieces of my heart hurting. I do not want him to walk the streets. He took that away from Russ. All right, uh, Mr. Lassane, is there a statement you'd like to make to the board before we turn it over to Ms. Nicole? Ms. Jackson, I'd like to say something to you, ma'am. I understood what the woman just said. And uh, yeah, I, I, I believe that what I did was wrong. I do. And the reason that I said that I don't know why I did, because it was 40 years ago, and I don't remember what I was thinking. I don't recall. And then Am I sorry for what I did? My God. Yes, ma'am, I am. I don't think of it every day. I really don't. I'm being honest. My father got killed in a boating. I don't think of him every day. But when I do think of it, it's not like it's just, oh, wow, I did that and that's it. No. Ma'am, I've got 40 years under my belt of thinking of it. I've done all I could to educate myself here with the life sentence. When I came to prison, this this was not a, a boy's home. You did the best you could to survive. And I'm being honest. I couldn't get in these educational courses because I had a life sentence. So I did what I could. And I didn't do it to come before you today and say, oh, God, look at all the good stuff I did. I did it to better educate myself. And can I make it on the street? Yes, ma'am, I can. Uh, she mentioned something about me saying, if I can, I'll get into alcoholics. And I, I don't mean as far as for me not doing it on my own. I'm saying opportunity to, to do it. I want to do it. I'd love to do that. I've, I've done that since I've been here. I've talked to children since I've been here. I've been to St. Jude's, my God. That in itself is a miracle. And I spoke to the children there. Some of them you tell them why you're here and some you don't. But I'm asking for mercy. I'm not asking for, for forgiveness. And I thank you again for the time that you've given me today. Um, I'd like to say this about somebody speaking to you. I don't know if she can hear me or not. Now, now your comments need to be to the board, not to the folks in the room here. Okay. With okay. We'll turn it over to Ms. Collins. Thank you. One of the things that the board looks at is a demonstration of rehabilitation. And I know that Bucky isn't um, one of the most articulate, and he's admitted that, but he is a man of his actions. and. His actions for the last 40 years have proven that he has been a rehabilitated man. Um, 40 years ago, Bucky came to Angola and he was immature, he was irresponsible, he was 21 years old. But today he's 62 years old. He's much more responsible, much more wiser, and, and he's, he's more mature than he was. And it's because of the work that he's put in to be the man that he is today. When he came to prison, he talked about educating himself. He came to prison with an 11th grade education. Um, since then, he's gotten his GED and he's taken dozens of programs and uh, certifications and he's gotten life skills that's gonna help with gainful employment if he has an opportunity for release. Um, and just to echo that for a little bit, when he came to prison, he he uh, could not keep a job. You know, he, he was having marital issues and he was having financial issues. But since he's been in prison, he's become a hard worker, one that has earned himself many highly trusted positions, 
um, in which he's become a prison need. Um, and he was even privileged, we didn't get a, he didn't get a chance to speak on this, but he was privileged to drive the draft horses uh, in many parades and, and many uh, hay rides, which is very, it should not be minimized because he's been able for 20 years to participate and interact with his community and he has not shown himself to be a threat. Um, and I just wanna mention the programs that he's taken. He's, he's taken anger management, he's taken things in forward change. He's, he's taught himself how to monitor his actions and how to reflect and, and make sure that he's you know, thinking for himself and others. And uh, you know, honestly, quite frankly, prison has changed his life. He's come a long way from the 21 year old who came to prison and he spent the last 40 years focusing on himself and creating pathways for himself to flourish and to become the man that he wants to see himself. And so I just ask that the board recognizes his accomplishments and gives him an opportunity to prove that he is a changed man and grant his request for relief. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cole. I think the board's prepared for that. We'll start with Mr. Freeman. Um, this is a very difficult case. First off, I want to thank y'all for showing up. There's no other way I could sit up here and say I know how you feel because I haven't been like that. But I do appreciate the courage to show me up here. And as far as Mr. LaSane, Mr. LaSane, you know, you have been locked up for 42 years. So I don't think you gave the best interview in the world by far. Um, but I, I do think you're trying to better yourself. Uh, you took classes when classes wasn't even welcome. You, know, you had a life sentence, and back when you started taking these classes, it, it wasn't to knock nothing off your time. It wasn't to do you any good. It was just for your own self. And I, I appreciate that you're better in yourself. And it's a very tough decision, but at this time, I think it's time to grant. You had a life sentence, and back when you started taking these classes, it, it wasn't to knock nothing off your time. It wasn't to do you any good. It was just for your own self. And I, I appreciate that you're better in yourself. And this is a very tough decision, but at this point, you can send us to 99 years, um, take, take advantage of the parole project. And that's my recommendation to send to the government, to the media parole area. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Lussain, uh, this is a very difficult case. The, the consequences of what you've done, what you did back then, still impact people today. It's truly not. Um, the person who life you took was 62. Yeah. You weren't much older, but he was still a kid, so he never got a chance. And his family was deprived of someone who could have been home. He's in a very tragic and hard life. And I hope, hope that on some level you have the capability of putting yourself in their shoes and understanding how they feel. And I'm glad you're taking programs, but these programs <coughs> aren't, aren't always the most important thing. It's, it's how you have developed in the community. Uh, you're, you're 62, you've been in over 40 years. Your last disciplinary write-up was in 2015. Uh, you've done good programming. You have been of service to the prison itself in terms of different jobs you've done. You've also um, been um, involved in inmate beneficial organizations such as Respect for Life. Um, and while I know that nothing you do here today is going to change the hurt and the loss of the victim's family, still experiences, 
I do believe that at this juncture, um, I would recommend to the governor on the occasion of ten things to ninety-nine and the wall the governor. Thank you, Mr. Rico. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Rose. Good morning. I've listened intently and I have seen you say things that you want us to hear. I've seen you say things that was probably fair to you and told with yourself. I want to tell you honestly, you've served 41 years, and I don't think you're ready to come back in society. You don't even have a full understanding of what you've done to the victim's family and what you've done to your family. I just, something is telling me like we said, Jeremiah said, don't grant you because of the lack of your incarceration. Are you ready to re-enter society and become a productive member of society? And I don't think you are. So based upon express opposition from law enforcement, express opposition from the victim's family, I'm going to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Rosane. Mr. Mayor Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Rosane, uh, I was here uh, in the audience. Uh, no one can know the pain that you experienced. I've lost a brother who was not here by his time to meet me. I know how that affected me. I can't imagine what it was for you to be going through the whole thing. I know how my brother was at the time. In the same, uh, my colleagues have, have indicated a lot of things about your interview today. I'm not going to reiterate all of those. Uh, you know, sometimes, we wish people were more articulate than they really are. Uh, I think you've been honest with us today. You've said to us that you are in there to better yourself, to try to become rehabilitated. And that's what our prison system is about. That's what we are here to determine. What have you done? to better yourself, to see that you won't commit enough, or you have learned some things while you've been in prison. Uh, I, I agree with the questions Judge Jackson asked of you. Uh, you know, there, there's a question of remorse. You've taken victim awareness. You've taken you know, several courses about victims. Uh, you've indicated to us, and I believe quite sincerely, that sorry that you don't think of this every day. And I think that's normal. I think your question, your answers today have been very honest. Based upon the time that you've served, the programs that you've conducted, the good positive remarks from the governor, I mean, from the uh, warden, my recommendation to the governor is like this, to the new 99 years. Thank you. So saying, I uh, have listened intently to everybody today. Um, this is a difficult, but I do believe that you know the time for you to be productive is now, based on your age. Um, I, I'm impressed with the service you've done for the prison. What Bowser said about you, based on institutional needs, you did whatever they, whatever they needed you to do. And I know sometimes that can't be pleasant, but 
do you have a low risk score? I do believe you were honest with us today. I don't think you said things that you thought we wanted to hear. I think you said some things that were kind of uh, off kilter uh, based on uh, interviews that we've had in the past. So based on all those things, I vote today would also be to commute your sentence with immediate parole eligibility. So you've gotten one unfavorable vote, four votes that were favorable. So we want that recommendation to the that your sentence be commuted to 91 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck, Dean. Thank you, board, very much. Well, um, I could say I'm a little shocked, but you know, a lot of these hearings go ways that confuse me. We'll review uh, the crime in detail so we can get a little bit more context than what we had and then we'll we'll just unpack this um okay so let's just make sure i'm not on mute and everything all right and please do like and subscribe if you haven't already so here it is his appeal and it goes through that the early morning hours of April 15th, 1981, the defendant drove to the Hungry Hobo Restaurant and Gas Station in Henderson, Louisiana. The attendant on duty was 18 years old. He was 18, guys. 18. Russ Laundry. The defendant put gasoline in his car and then claimed he had no money. Russ allowed the defendant to telephone someone to bring him money to pay his bill. The defendant only pretended to make the phone call. When Russ's attention was diverted to his regular chores, the defendant armed with a 22 caliber opened the cash register and took approximately $250 cash. As Russ unwittingly approached the cash register, the defendant afraid his theft would be discovered, struck Ross on the head with his pistol. The blow to the head did not knock Russ out, apparently, uh, not knock him out. Apparently panicked by the turns of events, the defendant forced Ross at gunpoint to walk to the back of the station. By the defendant's own admission, Russ pleaded repeatedly with him not to shoot him. As the two approached the rear of the station, the defendant forced Russ to kneel down. This is execution style. The defendant then shot Russ in the head. As Russ was falling, the defendant shot him again in the head. Russ fell slumped over a tire and died a short time later as a result of the bullet wounds. So the man that we just saw who self admittedly said he doesn't think about it every day. Took this 18 year old boy, had him kneel down execution style, and then put two bullets in the back of his head. The defendant later led police to the murder weapon ballistics tests of the gun revealed that at least one of the bullets recovered from the victim was fired from his gun in addition after a series of confessions the defendant reenacted the murder at the scene on videotape i tried seeing if i could find the video i couldn't the defendant was charged by a saint martin parish grand jury in first degree Then he did all these like appeals for pretty, you know, ridiculous appeals for a mistrial. Nothing really worth reading in here. He even says he joined AA because he didn't know anyone. So, I mean, like on his own admission, 
He didn't have a drinking problem. He didn't have a drug problem. No, he just shot him. Nothing what he said. I mean, the judges addressed this. They said it was a bad interview, um, that he was... Um, he's, you know, they, they looked at it as like, well, maybe he was just being honest, you know, he's nothing to hide. But at the beginning, when he starts to talk about the victim awareness and he goes through what I think was an act of crying, like it prepared something he had rehearsed because he picks up his tissue in front of him. He doesn't wipe his eyes once. And then when he describes why he went to victim awareness, he couldn't articulate it in any way at all. He said, What did he say? That he learned he was able to think, learned to be able to think before he acts from victim awareness. That doesn't make sense. His story about in 2015, why he stopped getting write-ups and he said, well, I realized then that I couldn't spend another Christmas with my family. Dude, you've been locked up since like what, 1980? Two, I, you had a life sentence. It took you that long to realize you wouldn't spend another Christmas with your family. You have a life sentence. He, he maybe he has like a really low IQ, and I don't know how you address that in terms of like trying to evaluate. How much of it is like pure sociopathic behavior and how much of it is just not being intelligent, not being able to articulate at all. By his own admission, I'm not the most intelligent person in the world. No, sir, you are not. But I also don't think you care. The victims literally venting uh, the daughter, what was it, the, no, the sister? He's only 18. Um, and then he goes and tries to, re you know, address everything that she says. And he, he says, I don't think about it every day. I lost my father in a boating accident. I don't think about that every day. It's not the same thing. You you took him to the back of the gas station, knelt him on his knees, and killed him execution style. And you put a second bullet in there to make sure he was dead. How do you how do you not think about that every day? I think Mr. Roche was right. The, the reason, you know, is that there's something wrong with this guy, which is what's, which is what's scary. It's, there is no confidence that if he gets out, that he won't do something weird again, violent again. You know, the governor has to sign off on it and I don't know what, I don't have any statistical analysis of, of how often non-unanimous decisions are granted. It's probably available out there. If any of you sleuths want to find it, I can post it or at least talk on it next time. Maybe the governor won't sign off on it. I know we have a governor leaving office now. And so he's going to have to do all of his commutations before he leaves. So this might just be a Google search away soon. Well, he does have to have another parole hearing um, once he gets the commutation to then get released. But I don't think we've ever seen a parole hearing after a commutation has happened that has then been denied. So, um, we haven't seen his parole hearing yet. So he's still locked up. We're just waiting for the commutation and then the parole hearing. But
he says, here's to quote him, it was 40 years ago and I don't recall what happened. It's like, what? Oh no, it was 40 years ago and I don't recall why I did it. And it's like, it was 40 years ago and you don't recall because it was 40 years? Like, again, we're going to go back. Is he just so low IQ? But the, can a low IQ even justify an answer like that and the inability to articulate? You know, I feel like they should do an IQ test for someone like this because how else can you evaluate if if someone is like just a cold-blooded killer or if they're just lacking, completely lacking the ability to, f to formulate proper sentences? to share their thoughts but if someone were to say it was 40 years ago and i don't recall and i don't think about it every day then you don't deserve to get the hell out of prison no you don't if you can't show proper remorse and understanding this is what the victim said and she what's going to stop him from doing it again nothing I feel like the board that let him out made excuses for why he had a bad interview and even turned it, well, to use the word twisted it in a way to say that it was authentic and it wasn't in your best interest, but it was truthful. He was being truthful when he said that it was 40 years ago. He doesn't recall. He was being truthful when he said that he doesn't, think about it every day. He was being truthful when he said that he joined AA because he didn't know anyone and whatever he wanted to. But then it's like, okay, well, if you think he's being truthful, then why would that make it any better? Because it does, he hasn't shown any, any, any reason that he wouldn't do it again. We've seen a lot of cases and a lot of stories and, and a lot of situations where there can be more brutal scenarios happening. Although this one is brutal. The, the idea that he was 18 and that he didn't have to do it and that he bent him down on his knees and, and shot him in the back of the head is, is um, pretty brutal. But it's also about how someone acts and he just didn't check any of the boxes for me but love to hear your thoughts and with that i'll let you go